Hi, my name is Mattia Murray, and welcome to The Longer Road. You are on The Longer Road if you have multiple intersectional identities that are often marginalized. You've had to work harder to get to the starting line, and you might feel behind. I'm here to provide hope, support, and practical tips, and to let you know that you're not alone. Welcome to my guest, Linda Tai. She is a mental health professional, a storyteller, and I know her from having taken her 12-week somatic regulation class, which I know I've sent at least at least five other people to take at this point, probably more because I talk about it so much. <laughs> I love it. Um, she is one of my personal heroes, so I'm very excited that she's here, and I'm going to let Linda introduce herself. But Taya, I tell you what, it is such a joy to be in your company again. And there's so much bubbling up inside of me as I'm sitting here with you. And check this out. You know what I'm doing right now? I'm doing that neurodivergent thing where I'm stalling, where I just let my mouth run because I'm like, oh, I'm on the spot. <laughs> oh. So introductions. I am, let's see here, where do we begin? I was born in Vietnam. I was raised in Australia. These days I live in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is the traditional lands of the Dene people of the Middle Tanana Valley. I often think of, of myself as redefining what it means to be American and redefining what it means to be Australian and redefining what it means to be Vietnamese. And as I look back on my life, I am just ever so grateful because in Australia I never felt quite Vietnamese enough and I never felt quite Australian enough. And it was here in Alaska that I actually got to experience how Vietnamese I am and how Australian I am and reclaim that and in the process of that, discover and explore and realise how screwed up <laughs> that whole journey <laughs> has been and how amazing it is that I survived. And to be able to come out the other side of that healing journey and be a mental health clinician, a somatic coach, a speaker, an educator... Um, and to be able to be in the world in bigger ways, in much bigger ways. Beautiful. Thank you. And opening question, what are you passionate about right now? Right now in this moment, about a month ago, I came back from a week-long experiential workshop, very pioneering, very experimental, very co-created, and it was bringing in together ketamine, and ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. And the psychotherapy modality we, we were using was psychodrama structures. Okay, so let's separate the two. So ketamine is an anesthetic, but in low doses, it's a psychedelic, meaning that it alters your state of consciousness. And so you can take ketamine nasally, um, orally via lozenges, intramuscularly, through an intramuscular injection or intravenously. And so we did the intramuscular injections. And then... There are various dosing and dosages that you can do with that, and it's very much dependent on each individual. And then the psychodrama structure side of things is where, in a group setting, you recreate the tableau of your life. So, and I know I said excited about it because I am excited about it. And yet, I remember when I first ex like witnessed it, I was like, "What the fuck is this? This is like ten years of therapy in the space of an hour, and I'm like being blown out of my 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 stratospheres right now." But you get other group members to like, "Will you play the role of my real father?" And then you place that person like exactly where it feels right for you, and then you get to say the things to your real father that your the, the truth that's on your heart, and then you ask someone else, can you play the role of my ideal father? And then that person comes and sits close and it's strange and new and weird and conceptually has never been imprinted upon you. So your brain's going, what the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck? And then this person says, if I were your real father, you would have been the apple of my eye and I would have picked you up and held you and played with you every day or whatever the words were that you needed to hear, right? And you're giving these people the words to say back to you based on like the intense depth of your wound. And so you finally get to hear the words from someone who's like playing that role and then the, the grief just comes, right? The grief just comes and it, 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 it opens a floodgate and a path for the imprinting somatically and at the nervous system level 
of what you didn't get to experience. And so trauma isn't just what happened that shouldn't have happened, it's what didn't happen that should have happened. It's the failure of that imprint to happen. And so with the psychodrama structures, I got to have imprinted upon me the experience of an ideal parents, both ideal parents. I also got imprinted upon me ideal ancestors. I got to give my parents ideal elders because being refugees, the old people were left behind, the elders were left behind. Right, the disabled people were left behind. The you know we we brought our children. Can you imagine not bringing your children with you? And yet the elders were like, we've lived here our entire lives. We can't leave. Like it's too, it's too much for us. And so my entire community had like one or two elders amongst everyone. And as a result, I grew up wanting to take care of my parents. I could feel the burden and the weight of what they carried. And so in my psychodrama structured to be able to give my parents like ideal elders that would have been there for them in the ways in which they needed back there back then opened up this huge energetic space around me to not have to take care of them anymore and when that opened up I was then able to take in the ideal parents and what I've noticed since then is one the the ketamine allows the neuronal networks in my brain to open up just that little bit more with all of this new information and allow it to be imprinted at a deeper level because I've done that psychodrama structure experience in the past without the ketamine. And what I've noticed since my re-entry into the world is that I am no longer defaulting to taking care of your nervous system in order for my nervous system to feel safe. Mm. And that's been a lifelong journey for me because it's a survival strategy. It's an extension of love. It's a way in which I helped keep my family together. It's a way in which I got my own needs met to feel important or to feel like I belong, to feel worthy, to feel useful. And now that I've been imprinted with delight and joy for my mere existence, and that other people take delight in my mere existence and in my joyousness. That in and of itself has freed me from being hyper vigilant and hypersensitive to other people's nervous systems and managing and caretaking and turning me inside out at that nervous system level in order to accommodate and comfort your nervous system. It can become more of a superpower rather than something that depletes me slowly over time or very quickly (laughs) over the course of a day. You know those days, Matea, where (laughs) you come home and you have to like turn the lights off and be in a dark room and crawl under your, 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 your weighted blanket and I pull all my stuffies in and I call my dog over and I just need no sensory input. And I actually need to be around nothing that needs anything from me. And then I open my eyes and then my plants need water. My dishes are saying they need me to do them. My socks are saying they need me to pick them up from the floor, right? It's, 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 and I just got to gotta disconnect altogether from anything that might possibly need me. Mm. Yeah. Part of that, you know, the autistic meltdown, the neurodivergent meltdown, the CPTSD, like, drain, my window of capacity has gotten so depleted because I didn't realise this is how I move through the world. And now on the other side of this journey, I'm able to see all the baby steps that needed to happen before I could do a ketamine and psychodrama experience without everything in my being just going, ah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that, that resonates. And also, uh, I mean, I haven't done that experience obviously, but the, you know, these different experience, healing experiences we have, the sort of the slow versus the, the fast, right? I actually, I had an episode about that recently where I was talking about how I think for neurodivergent people, we want the interest and the excitement and the drama of the big change, but then our body is like, no, it's too much. And I can't imagine what something like that would have been like at the beginning of my journey because there was just too much 
to process. Like I can, I can only imagine I would have needed to shut down for like months afterwards. And now I feel like I could do something like that and have that, you know, that deeper imprinting, that somatic experience, but I, it's because so much work has already happened. Yeah. That was the interesting part about the ketamine because we had three doses and the last dose was a high dose experience. And we actually experimented like ketamine first and then psychodrama after and then psychodrama first, ketamine after, and then let's do ketamine and psychodrama at the same time. Uh, And then let's do the the high ketamine experience to complete the week. And for about four or five days afterwards, I had what I call the ketamine hangover. But Mm. really what it is, is it was like the car was in first gear and it wouldn't go any faster. And a part of me was like, but hang on, I've got to get shit done. And it wasn't going to happen. I could not willpower myself. And what, yep. what happened is that I just had to go in first gear as I moved through the world. And that allowed, I believe, for the experience to be integrated because it forced me to slow down instead of me just catapulting back into my world and going wow that was a great experience and (laughs) (laughs) and I got my socks blown off and it was fantastic because you know there's that ADHD part where I mistake intensity for intimacy Mm -hmm. yeah and I mistake enmeshment for intimacy so I chase intense enmeshment and I love it (laughs) and the ketamine not only allowed things to to seep into a deeper level during the experience, I also noticed for some folks the ketamine allowed them to open up and actually have the experience. But for me, most powerfully was that afterwards, I couldn't just slingshot back into my life. Yeah. Which speaks exactly into what you were just saying. Yeah. And the slow change doesn't feel as sexy. It's not, you know, it doesn't have the intensity, but for most people, most of the time, that's what actually imprints, right? Unless you're in these, you know, big, beautiful curated spaces where you're getting, you know, you have all that support and you have this sort of extra boost behind it as you did. But then at home, you don't even necessarily want that, right? You want it, it, you want it to be sustainable. And I I love that you mentioned integration because I feel like integration is the most important thing of all of the work, right? We do the, we do the work potentially with a practitioner and then we have to integrate and it's the day to day, right? We can't rely on a teacher or a person to always be guiding us through every moment, right? Yes. And that's where the integration is structural. There's so much social justice that's actually involved in the capacity Mm. to integrate because we, it's, it's a challenge to integrate when you are living in survival mode. Oh, yeah. And to have enough spaciousness in your life where integration is possible is actually, I think, foundational to the journey of healing. Yeah. 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 And I actually, as a, as a trauma therapist, I am really reticent to do large chunks of trauma reprocessing work unless someone has the space afterwards for integration and that's structural in their lives it's the partner it's the pets it's the working part-time it's the I was raised in Australia you can your doctor can write you a medical certificate and you can collect unemployment benefits for three months that would be such a great time to then do trauma reprocessing work because you've got fixed income coming in and if you happen to be living with folks who are supportive of that and of you and able to help you with having food on the table and those aspects of life it makes integration more possible and I and I also believe that healing is a lifelong thing Mm -hmm. and yet some of us with nervous systems that run a bit more sympathetic (laughs) that are a little bit more fast we 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 want we want it all now yeah. And it's okay. <laughs> and it's okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was actually, that was one of the first things I learned from you in the, in the thematic regulation class, the first, cause I took it twice. <laughs> so the first time I took it, um, 
I was, I was having stuff come up that was so intense that I would like then miss, you know, the next 10 minutes of what you were saying. Cause I was just like floating in my head, like thinking about something. And I remember one of the first things being just that the, the polyvagal, the window of tolerance described in more detail than I'd seen it before. And talking about, you know, kind of people who are shifted up, you know, maybe more comfortable in the higher end of that, you know, pushing toward fight, flight, freeze, et cetera. And just, and I was like, oh, that's me. That's my nervous system. My nervous system feels better in this area in general, in that I feel so much less safe at rest. And that was so freeing because to me, I didn't go, oh, I need to fix this immediately. I was just like, oh, great. That's how I'm currently functioning. This is how I'm like being okay. I'm not going to try to force myself to rest. And it was actually like, again, over the course of now, the last, I guess, few years, uh, or a couple of years since that, I have, I now can rest more and actually have it feel good and have like a much broader array of things that I consider to be rest as well. And not just trying to force my brain to do something that it did not like and did not want. (laughs) For some of us, rest is like, let me pick up something I'm totally passionate about and geek out and dive into it and lose myself in it for a few hours. Like that's actually rest. Yeah. Or restful for us. Yeah. Yes. Yay. Yeah. And I know like right right before we started uh, recording, we were also talking about rest seasonally, Mm -hmm. which I feel like this is the first year where I'm really honoring and noticing how much I slow down in the winter. And especially with the, with the darkness, which is funny because I grew up in Seattle, which is like, (laughs) it's, it's a dark place, literally (laughs) in terms of sunlight. So it's not even that I have super high sun needs. It's more just in the winter. I always slow down, but typically I've had, even when self-employed, I've typically created a schedule for myself that didn't really allow for those ups and downs as much. And now, for example, there were a couple different things I wanted to do that would have been really fun. Uh, one was queer soccer, which I was doing in the summer and then, and they're continuing in the fall, but in the fall, it would be f- ending at like 9 30 PM, 45 minutes away from my house. And I was like, I just won't be happy if I do that. Same thing. If I take an art class ending at that time, I was like, by then, even if I'm not literally in bed, my body just wants to be chilling. It does not want me to be exercising or <laughs> you know trying to be creative. Like this is not the time. And I think in any previous year, I would have just kind of pushed through and said, oh, it's fine. It'll be fun. And then just been very grumpy for the last hour of that activity the whole time because I know myself and that's what would have happened. So yeah, I've, I've been anyway, in a lot of ways, I've been noticing and honoring the the real change in energy seasonally that my body has. Yeah. The, one of the secrets of life is that it's not about managing your time. It's about managing your energy levels. Yeah. And that begins with actually noticing what your natural rhythms are and recognizing the ways in which we have gotten messaging otherwise. Yep. Yes. Yes. You know, I got really good advice from my accountant once when I was in my early 20s. He said, because I was wanting to create a budget, and he said, don't create a budget. Start with writing down what you're spending and what you're earning. And this way we can actually notice what reality is and then we can base a budget based on reality (laughs) rather than what you think you should be saving or what you should be earning. Let's base it on reality and then based on reality, we'll set some goals and then we'll figure out what the shortfall is and how you could make that up. And the same goes with energy. Like start with noticing the natural rhythms of your day, your week, your month, your year. And giving your body permission to communicate to you what it is that your body needs and would find nourishing. Yeah. 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 And for me, the point of being nourished at this point is to feel good, not to just be able to work harder. (laughs) Yes. Fuck productivity culture. Yes. Yeah, your your inherent self-worth is not based on how much you create or produce or perform. Yeah. 
I love that you're nodding right now. And I hope everyone that's listening right now is nodding as well. Your inherent self-worth is not based on how much you create, produce, or perform. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know that that lands especially hard with my audience because for people who, you know, I mean, for example, disabled people are lifelong given the message the, the exact opposite of that, right? That it's you need to prove that you deserve to be here. And certainly in American culture, we don't have that option to, you know, take the three month burnout break. Like sometimes we're forced to because we can't work anymore, but it's not supported structurally. I'm going to take a big breath and lean into the pain that's in my chest right now in the naming of that. Yeah. It sucks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And what that also means is if and when you're able to begin to scaffold together in baby steps what it is that you need to not then feel guilty for having that. For having the needs. For having the needs and also for having the nourishment. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, um, yeah. it's the... It's the disabled version of survivor guilt, which I experience at the class level. I also experience it at the um, racialized identity level. I also experience it that at the refugee level, that there were people who were left behind. And I can also see how for disabled individuals that there is a survivor guilt that then happens when you're able to begin to scaffold and put together the supports that you need in order to flourish, that there's a survivor guilt that arises as a result of that. Yeah, thank you for naming that. We stand on the shoulders of giants, Mattia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what is it, what is it <laughs> I say? In, in 12 step meetings, we say we only keep what we have by giving it away. Mm. Yeah, right. And I believe that's where like the next wave of decolonization happens is where the gatekeeping stops. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's where these things that were previously only taught to psychotherapists that they did with their clients in order to you know, have a living and, be, and call themselves experts is now available freely to the world through books, through podcasts, through websites, through all forms, all mediums. Yeah. Yeah. Not just words in academic journals <laughs> that are such a struggle yeah. to read. <laughs> I, I love spread. That's like one of my passions is spreading the me message that whatever you want to learn, it is out there for free. And if you want to, you know, purchase something that is giving it to you in a more direct or quick or supported manner, that's great. But also it is possible to find all this information. And at the same time, right, going back to the structural support of people having the time to find what they need, learn it and then have time to integrate it, that itself requires privilege of, of that space and time to be able to actually take it in and like in the way that you learn best. Yes. Yes. I survived for a long time on YouTube videos and TED Talks. Mm -hmm. You know, when I began my healing journey, I think the internet had been out for not very long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And somehow YouTube emerged and that's when I started learning about the ACEs study, adverse childhood experiences. Uh, I started learning more about childhood trauma. I was in the throes of my own addiction recovery and I'm hearing Gabor Mate talk and then I'm hearing, I'm hearing so much that got me thinking, oh, it's not me. It's not like me right. that I'm the fuck up that I can't not do the things that I can't not do. And I had no idea that my childhood had impacts on my adulthood. I had no idea that it was about what happened to me rather than what's wrong with me. And so you you use what you, you it's it's available there for you. You just got to find it. You got to scrap it together. We are resourceful mm -hmm. and we are resilient, <laughs> <laughs> and we've made it thus far. And you know, who can you ask for help? You know, how can you ask for that help? How can you find it? What is it that you need? What is it that you want? Because whatever you want for you, I want for you. I love that. Yeah. So can you talk more about that 
healing journey as that was starting at, at, at I mean, anything that you want to say about any point in it, um, totally open-ended, but just you started listening to things like, what was that process like for you? Well, if we go back, if we backtrack a little bit to the conversation that we had earlier about this, the, the, the social justice piece and the structural piece, I was raised in Melbourne. It was a big city. And I always thought I was depressed, like there was something wrong with me. I hadn't found the right combination of like boyfriend and um, leisure activities and career and money, right? Like I just couldn't figure it out. And because I couldn't figure it out, I was a fuck up. And then I stumbled upon Alaska and it was these wide open spaces and it was people who come together to fish and to hunt and to pick berries and to do things with their hands and to be outside and and I fell in love with a whole new way of life and people who did things with their bodies rather than the messages that I got in the city, which is study, go to school, study hard, learn something, be the expert. I needed to move my body and I needed to be with other people who also wanted to move their bodies and to be outside. Anyway, I met a man, I fell in love. We bought five acres of land in 2006, which at the time was less than $11,000. And I had that money saved up through my waitressing tips, as well as through the other odd jobs I had along the way. Because while I worked full time in corporate, I was in direct marketing and product marketing and then export logistics and operations before that. I actually made more as a waitress than what I did like doing the corporate thing. And yet I couldn't cut the corporate thing. Like the eight to four or nine to five every day, five days a week was like a slow death sentence for me. I couldn't do it. Like the body clock thing couldn't adjust to it I couldn't figure it out and so discovering Alaska and discovering that land was relatively affordable based on what I had and then meeting a man who knew how to build and then we built a log cabin together on this piece of land that is outside city limits so there's no planning permits there's no council submissions there's no architectural approval colonized world rubbish that, and I know that those safety things are there in place for a reason but they actually ha- hold us back from being resourceful from learning from each other how to do things for ourselves and so I'm having this journey of learning how to hunt and fish and grow my own vegetables and then we build a log cabin together where we're literally building it as we build it and so for less than thirty thousand dollars at the age of 29 we're technically retired because we own where we live. Mm. And that gave me the breathing space. We had no running water. We had electricity. Our electricity bill was 30 bucks a month. We would go and fetch water and in five-gallon jugs and bring it home. And so our water bill a month was like less than a quarter, <laughs> as in less than a quarter of a dollar. <laughs> Um, we had the fortune of being able-bodied even though our nervous systems were shredded and I wasn't functional in the world in a huge capacity because I was just sharp and prickly and unable to engage with other humans in ways that were effective for moving through the world. Let's <laughs> just put it like that. Like I was really freaking traumatized. Like all the people I knew during that period of time, like we're not friends now and I don't blame them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so we ate salmon and moose and rice and beans and one of us would work at a time or one of us would work seasonally or we'd work part time. But yet we had that time for our nervous systems to actually heal. And people ask me as a trauma therapist who's trained in all these modalities, you've got a lot of, like, I got so much benefit personally from internal family systems, from brain spotting, from sensory motor psychotherapy, from the safe and sound protocol, from neurofeedback, from all of these modalities. And I offer them to people with insurance and people with Medicaid. And there was a lot of work that happened prior to that that allowed me to be able to go back to school, to read, (laughs) to integrate information (laughs) Um, and to actually do the work, to actually do the work, yeah. And so it was just this slow process of not realising how traumatised I actually was but knowing that I needed some space and time to heal that 
turning point really was having somewhere to live that was stable and secure. Yeah. Same. Housing stability was an absolute noticeable turning point in in my journey as well. When I got a an affordable unit through the city, uh, when I did that, it was just like, oh, okay, there's 25% of my nervous system is just taken care of. Yes. <laughs> and then also what you said about, you know, like uh, realizing uh, the pre-work, because I also kind of can look back and see that period of time of, of sort of pre-prep for the official work. Uh, I was just so shocked to learn over time how much of my personality was just trauma. <laughs> like this, that I was like, this is who I, who, you know, if I were to describe myself at a party and look back and I'm just like, oh yeah, no, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> you know, not that it's a thing that needs to be fixed, just how much yeah. of the ways that I moved through the world, um, the ways that I, you know, used my energy and targeted my energy and the, and the things that I was trying to extract is the word that comes to mind, but the things I was trying to get people to give me were so much based on my needs, based on my own trauma. And now I have, you know, I'm still fundamentally the same person in a lot of ways, but like a lot of the things I was trying to do and get socially are very different at this point. Yeah. It's that bit where pleasure and pain becomes confused. (laughs) 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 Knowing laugh. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. It's that, um, Oh, one of my friends has this phrase. Um, I would, I would shop for condemnation while soothing myself and comforting myself, or I would shop for comfort and soothing while condemning myself. Oh my God. That's really good. Yes. Yeah. It's um it's painful to look back. Like I used to bait mm-hmm. bait people to yep. dislike me. And I would bait people to get into arguments with me. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. that's that thing, that whole shopping for condemnation while soothing myself. And in so many ways, that condemnation was actually a form of soothing because it's familiar. Right. And it's so much more comfortable for me than the pain of someone actually liking me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's definitely, I, I also really love the way you talk about, like one of the other kind of big takeaways for me from your work is this language around uh you know, superpowers and kind of, you know, these, that these coping mechanisms work. Yes. And they're not, you know, like the goal of healing is not to come in and just like sweep away all the coping mechanisms and leave an empty space to put things in. It's like, no, these are, you're surviving (laughs) with these. And if you're in, if you're in survival mode for any reason, right, whether it's the structural stuff Mm -hmm. or, or if it's that the structural stuff is getting better, but you're emotionally still in survival mode, like that's, we, we have to be with that and honor that and allow that in certain ways. It's not just about like wiping all of that away. Anyway, I I really want to do a podcast at some point in in praise of dissociation because of that. (laughs) You know what? I need to dissociate sometimes because literally my system is taking in up to 40% more information than the average nervous system and I get fucking overwhelmed and I just Mm -hmm. need a -hmm. break. Mm -hmm. Like I need to not have that. Mm -hmm. And dissociation can be a great way to do that. So anyway, not, you know, nobody else needs to do that. That's just how my system works that every once in a while, I'm like, you know what? I'm checking out. Yes. <laughs> <Bye>. <laughs> yes. Yes. And it's the same for the 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 pleasure and pain, you know, connections that get confused or distorted or wired um the wrong way that then expresses to the world in ways that are that are painful. Mm-hmm. Um for other people and for myself in 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 hindsight, but at the time that was the only way I knew how to protect myself from the pain of people actually potentially figuring out that I don't know who I am and the fear of people actually liking me because people actually liking me is painful because if you know me and you like me, then you can hurt me even more. Mm. Yeah. And so there was just so much work to do on so many levels 
before I was able to let go of the part of me that was so much more comfortable with you disliking me. It was my superpower. Yeah. Yeah. Just like dissociation is a superpower. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. and also, I mean, there's, you know, there's the the grief of looking back, you know, so another uh, experience I've had kind of coming out as autistic is, oh, and I, oh, and also, I don't know if I've told you this, because I don't know if I've talked to you since then, but I did get an official autism diagnosis, which is, I guess, nice and useful in certain ways, but it, it was, it was helpful for me uh, in certain ways. And realizing, you know, people do have disliked me for some actual reasons from how I'm presenting in the world, right? And that's okay. But then there's, as I'm making more autistic friends in particular, and they just love and accept me for who I am, and I don't need to hide or, you know, it's having that experience. There's like, it's great. And also I'm looking back and I'm just like, fuck, <laughs> like I have a lot of, a lot of relationships where, or, you know, attempted friendships or relationships where uh, it was just, they were never going to like me. And that's really, you know, painful as well to just look back and realize, oh, I was really just banging my head against that wall and it was, it was never going to happen. Yeah. And how we're trained from such a, a young age to hustle for our self-worth, mm. right? We're trained. And, and for some of us, we were trained to go to the barber shop to get a carton of milk <laughs> and you're not going to get a carton of milk from the barber shop, right? Except somehow <laughs> we think that we might if we keep trying hard enough because we live in a society that says just try harder, just try harder, like suck it up, stuff it down, mask up, be someone else. You're not doing it right. Try harder. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so it's, yeah, it's, it's, complex and it's nuanced and we're always creating shadow and these days I can look back on my life and cringe and be grateful because that means that I've grown if I look back on my life and I don't cringe then to me that's an indication of I haven't actually grown can you say more about we're always creating shadow I believe that consciousness always rises, as in we're always growing. Even when it feels like things are not changing or not shifting, we're actually always growing. And as a result of that growth process, there's always something to look back on. The blossoming flower looks back and says, oh, I was a really tight bud. Tight. I was so <laughs> tight. <laughs> And the, the, the tight bud looks back and goes, oh, wow, I was like, I lived in the armpit of the stalk and the, and the, the leaf. <laughs> <laughs> I was an armpit dweller. I'm so glad to be a tight bud. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the armpit dwelling side shoot that eventually becomes the flower looks back and says, I was this hard little seed or I don't know whatever step there, there might there's other stages in between right yeah <laughs> yeah and yet that seed has everything inside of it that it needs in order to grow in order to become what it already is in its cosmic blueprint and so the the opportunity is always there to to embrace growth and embrace impermanence and embrace grief and to take delight in that. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that so much because what I like, certainly one of the messages I am here to spread and like the reason I'm making this podcast all together is this idea that at every stage of that plant's journey, it just is what it is. Yes. And that, especially that message that you said of the seed having everything it needs, like the blueprint, I believe that so strongly, you know, even of the, like, I had such horrible mental health for so long, like it was so, so, so bad. And I am at this point, I'm like, yeah, it's possible I could become depressed again, but it hasn't happened in a really long time. And that's. I, I, that's kind of what I'm, you know, here to say is like, hey, 
people who've only met me in the last five years, they're like, wow, you're so put together. And I'm like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> people who knew me in college know what's up. <laughs> And, you know, this is not even my final form. I'm 35, so. <laughs> <laughs> you know that thing where you take those psychedelic trips and you and and in your mind's eye you're seeing an elephant turn into a, uh, turn into a flower, turn into a butterfly, turn into a cloud, turn into a sea lion, turn into a mountain range. Like it's, it's that. Yeah. 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 And none of those images are inherently bad, right? Like those, those stages are not bad to be in. And I want people to like, my ideal is that people can be, uh, you know, happy enough or feel good enough where they are in the phase that they're in and just like, you know, be open to that growth if they want it. But also, you know, within the growing process, we absolutely have plateaus or need to take a break. Like over the, you know, many years of therapy that I've had, I've had periods of time where I've taken a break because I'm just like, okay, and now I want to not think about this stuff for a while. Like mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to process every week all of the time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I believe the growth is happening anyway. Mm -hmm. And there are ways in which we can be supported in that and channel that energy when that energy is emerging or emergent. And yet that seed is going to become a plant become a flower can can we provide the conditions mm -hmm. can i provide the conditions for my seed to flourish and can i provide the conditions for other people's seeds to flourish yeah and i think when i was in my trauma i was all about me and what i need mm. and not knowing what i needed and the gift of recovery is the gift of learning how to experiment, how to explore, how to discern, how to engage in the trial and error that needs to happen in order to find out. Thank you so much for being here. This is part one of two. So join us next week to hear the rest of Linda's amazing interview. We talked for an hour and a half straight. So I went ahead and split it into two parts. And I hope you're having a restful holiday season. Thanks so much. And I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. If you know someone who would be helped by this podcast, please share it with them. And I'd love to hear your thoughts and suggestions at Mattia at MattiaMarie.com. That's M-A-T-T-I-A -T -T -E 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 at M-A-T-T-I-A-M-A-U-R-E-E dot com. Thank you.